This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com, and today we have a Stampede Wrestling legend with us. He's wrestled the Los Angeles Territory, Japan, all over the place. None other than the inventor of the ladder match, Dan Crawford. How are you doing today, sir? Oh, really well. Thank you so much for having me back on your program. I, I really appreciate it. I know you have a terrific viewing audience, and... Uh, you know, your program provides for us to talk about so many things. And I think today, I, I think it's a unique subject and something that I want to commend you on is that we're going to pay tribute to the fallen, to the people that are no longer with us. And I, I can't recall the last time I've ever done an interview or seen someone host an interview where we had that opportunity. So good on you for doing this. And thank you for having me. Yes, unfortunately, in wrestling, a lot of the guys fall early. You've done very well for yourself. Uh, I believe you're in your late 70s now, but a lot of your friends have unfortunately passed away from not only Stampede Wrestling, but other territories as well. But, but one guy that might be good to start off with, since he's synonymous with Stampede Wrestling, is the the man that started it himself, Stu Hart, who I know you're you're very close with. We've had uh, his sons on the channel quite a bit discussing him, but you you might be a little bit more impartial. Well, you know what? I'd like to, since we have the opportunity to talk about Stu, and 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 back to your opening comments. You're right. I I now get the label. I'm like one of the last men standing. I have a birthday in a couple, three weeks or a few weeks, and I turn 77. And I'm grateful to have a career and to be here still. And it saddens me that so many are gone, and so many at a much younger age, too. So consequently, I, I never for a moment, you know, not, not think about not being here. Uh, I appreciate that. And along with that, I, I'm really grateful that we can open with talking about Stu because I think your listeners, your viewers would find it interesting to know more about him, you know, outside the dungeon, outside his wrestling career, outside his promotional career, that he was a very unique man. And I guess it's privileged for me to speak to him because he did break me in the business in 1969. He was very kind to me. And I, I think I shared with you previously that Stu never stretched me once in a period of six, seven weeks before the first show, him breaking me in. You know, he never stretched me, and, and I was so grateful for that because I don't think I could have taken a stretching. Uh, I'm not a shooter or a tough guy and, and never, ever have indicated that I had any of those skills. So for some reason, maybe just out of kindness, he didn't uh, he didn't stretch me. But to speak about him personally, I should tell you, you know, yes, they, they had 12 children, him and Helen. But what made him so unique was his diversity of personality. This was a man who loved pets. He had cats. He had dogs. But he also had taste that was rather unique. I remember being at his home numerous times. We would talk about angles, uh, you know, different things we would do. And he would always point out to me the chandeliers that he had imported from other parts of the world. He had Persian rugs. He, he loved his dining room suite, solid wood. He had brought that in. He was all, very eccentric, actually. And, and the cars he drove, most people were not aware of it, but he loved limousine Cadillacs, not brand new ones. But he'd buy them five, six, seven, eight years old. And they were great for hauling wrestlers around. And I think that Stu actually enjoyed having these limousines. They were symbolic of who he was and, and, the, and the image that he had with it. You know, and, and funny, with the limousines, I should tell you, I drove his car more than probably anybody else uh, because he had a characteristic in his personality that was quite unique. Uh, every time we left Calgary for Edmonton, which was about a three-hour drive north, he would always start out driving and we'd just get to city limits and he would start nodding off and the car would drift off and I would reach and grab the wheel. The first couple of times this happened, I thought, my God, you know, he's how has he stayed alive so long, but, you know, going to sleep at the wheel so easily. So before you knew it, every time we would 
drive. After a while, I just got used to it. I'd watch him and I'd see his head nodding sort of, and he'd be leaning. And I'd say, Stu, would you like me to drive? And of course I'd say, yeah, that's a hell of an idea. And so of course I'd take the wheel and I drove the car and then he would sit in the passenger side. And for some reason he'd start chatting about wrestling. So I think that was his little sort of signal that he didn't want to drive all the time. So I got to know him very, very well. And he was a, a very deep man, a very intellectual in so many ways, had a very sharp memory for many people in the industry. He admired wrestlers, real shooters, the tough guys of the world, the George Gordiankos and them. But, you know, the other thing, too, that was interesting was this house. Everybody refers to it as a dungeon, but I was in all levels of that house. And there was some very unique furniture throughout the house. And he had a habit, which was, again, astonishing. Uh, when we would work out in the gym, we would then go into the big shower. He had this huge shower room, and we'd get all cleaned up. And then he would say, do you like fruit? And I'd say, yeah, I like fruit. Well, what were you? I didn't know what he meant by that. And then he'd walk me to another corner of the room, and here would be about five or 600 pounds of fruit, all stacked, bananas, apples, oranges, you name it. It was almost fermenting in this room. And he'd pick out a banana and he'd give me one. And I found out later that every Saturday he would take his Cadillac down to a Safeway at closing time. And he would bring in all the old fruit and put it in his car and take it home. And they would eat it in the house. So, you know, he was so eccentric in so many ways. And uh, he, another characteristic that he had that a lot of wrestlers would attest to, I'm sure, is that guys would get their paychecks on a Friday night. And I saw a lot of them, I guess the best way to describe it would be jumping up and down and almost protesting their pay. They were not satisfied. And I'd watch Stu take each guy privately and walk them down the hallway into a little area. And five, 10 minutes later, the guy come back with a big smile on his face. And I saw this happen so often. And I finally asked some of the guys, I said, you were quite angry there earlier. And what exactly happened? And he said, oh, Stu, he, he pointed out that, yes, this check was a little off, but don't worry, we're building some big shows and we're going to make up for this. So he had such a diplomatic way of addressing the personalities of wrestlers. He was a very unique man and uh, truly miss him. Uh, I, I would tell you that not only was I appreciative of him breaking me into the business, but I had admiration and love for him for what he did for me and, and he did for so many other. He was symbolic of wrestling in Western Canada. And, and I think many of us owe our careers to the fact that he started us. And I don't think I would have went anywhere. I, I, I quite frankly, even though I retired with WWE, if Stu had not broke me into the business and give me a chance, I, I don't think I would have had an opportunity. And of course you add that, add to that the fan support and you've got a formula for success. So I'm very grateful. But if you have any questions about Stu or your, your listeners do, I'd be happy to address them. Well, maybe you can clear something up because a lot of wrestlers like to say that he used the same spatula to pick up yes. cat residue and cat feces as the foo. But Diana Hart had told us that he actually did have a spatula for the cat droppings, yeah. but it was a separate spatula yes. and people would exaggerate and mix that up what was your yeah and thought? that that could be true because i actually saw him once pick something up and i i would say to you i cannot positively say that he used the same spatula but i did see him do that and that's another characteristic of his personality i should point out he loved the kitchen the sunday gatherings he would have all the family there i always admired that and respect that i think all of us as individuals and family members if we can bring our families together for a Sunday gathering every Sunday to meet and talk about things and have family come together, that really, to me, is one of the priorities of life is to be able to be close to your family. So absolutely true. And he had an amazing kitchen. It was all stainless steel. He had all the best of everything in there. And he loved cooking. Like I remember once, I think, I can't remember if it was Brad or Ross, but they said he cooked like a 40 pound turkey. Well, that's like a turkey on steroids. And, you know, Stu really enjoyed himself in the kitchen. And he used to always talk to me about these different recipes. And yeah, so it really, really, did. he had a great fondness for the kitchen. And the spatula story could go both ways. But I will say he had a great fondness for that cat. 
I remember, I think, I don't know if I shared this with you once before, but I sat in his living room and uh, he was sitting on the opposing uh, couch and the cat came up and laid beside him and he had a coat hanger and he was stroking the cat's belly and that cat completely spread out. You could have counted the cat one, two, three. It looked like it was submitting. I mean, you, know, you could just tell the cat had a great affection for him and he did for the cat. But the kitchen story about the spatula, there has to be some truth to that because I, I definitely saw him once pick something up, but I cannot say that it was only the same spatula. Now, as far as a wrestling trainer and as a promoter, since you knew him during his younger days, uh, as opposed to in the 80s uh, when he was starting to slow down, yeah. Did he give you any advice that you really took to heart? Yes. The excellent question. He had a couple of things that he once, when we talked, we traveled for hours in the car. And I remember I was very transparent with him. I said, I'm not a tough guy. I'm not the biggest, best looking guy in the world. I'm open to suggestions. I'm happy to hear anything you can help me with. And one of the things he used to say to me, not once, but on numerous occasions, he would say to me, you get a lot further on grease than you do gravel. And at first, I, I didn't really know what he meant by that. It, it didn't, you know, it didn't really strike a chord with me. And then as time went on, I started to note that he was very diplomatic. He was always about a resolution. He never barked at people. I never saw him get angry at anybody. He would listen quietly. And it was like he was always, rather than dwelling on the problem, he would find a solution. And for some reason, his calmness and, and his intellect, he would travel much further with dealing and managing people than being harsh or, or dictatorial. Uh, this, So I, I got the meaning of that. And then he told me another saying, too, which was rather interesting. It really proved to be beneficial for me. Uh, he used to say to me, if you if you manage your your nickels, your dollars will take care of themselves. And of course, over time, I learned to realize that you have to save your money. You have to make financial planning a part of your life. And as I said numerous times, the wrestling business can be a porthole. It's not a picture window. You have a limited time. Some guys have a very short go in the business. Some guys last for years. But if you look at the percentage of the most successful guys in the business, you're lucky to be in the top 5% of wrestlers who made any money and really made a career of it. So his two philosophies were don't stir people up, you know, try to get along with everybody. And number two, manage your money. And those stuck with me. I think they were, they influenced me a lot. And you know, there were so many other little wisdoms. I called them pearls. He was off, always, he was always offering little pearls of advice. So uh, if people really got to know him, you would like him very much outside the dungeon. Some wrestlers have written in books over the years that the sons didn't give Stu as much respect as the folklore says, such as Smith would take kicks at him here and there and, and things like that. Did you ever notice that the sons didn't give him as much respect as the wrestlers or is, the, is that just wrestlers exaggerating? Yeah, unfortunately, I've always made a point of not speaking to a subject that I don't have any knowledge of, and I don't. I can only speak to what I observed, what I heard, and, and I would tell you I never saw a disrespect from any of the boys, and particularly not the girls, that's for sure. And uh, Smith was always an anonymy. He was sort of a, a unique individual, really. He was a guy who lived in his own world. I liked him very much. He was always kind to me and very generous with his comments, and my family liked him. Uh, but he was certainly, he was, uh, uh, I guess he was the black sheep of the family, you might say. But, and even Stu would make reference to Smith periodically, uh, not so much in disappointment. It was always, you never knew what was happening next with Smith. But I don't recall ever one of the boys ever disrespecting Stu. Matter of fact, I think they admired him and they respected him for who he was. And I know he loved his family because we talked about it all the time. That was another one of his pearls. He used to always emphasize to me personally when we drove in the car, he said, a lot of people will come and go in your life and a lot of wrestlers will be some of those people. But he said, your family's there for you from the start to finish. And, and it was so true. And, you know, it, it makes me, and I've learned to be 
more open and transparent about my failures in life, you know, we can easily talk about our belts, our trophies, our plaques. But I think facing the reality is that each of us in life have things that we wish we would have done differently. And, uh, you know, some some of us, and myself included, if we could go back in time, spending more time with my family and focusing more on the balancing of wrestling and my careers and my family, I think was critical. Uh, and I, I would hope that any young wrestlers that are watching this, if there's any advice that I could give them or leave with them, is to always remember that your family are there from the start to the finish, but a lot of things in between come and go. So I think Stu was a great family man. I took him out to dinner numerous times, and towards the end of his life, I had the chance to take him and Helen out to dinner in a very nice restaurant, you know, hotel, actually, in in Calgary. And, and we talked about, we reminisced about the business and the people that were in it, the ones that are gone and the ones that have succeeded and the ones that have failed. And, you know, Stu was very cognizant of all those things. And, of course, Smith passed away a few years ago right. due to cancer. And, unfortunately, just a couple months ago, his daughter, uh, Satania, was her official name. I forget what it was shortened to, but she passed away really young. So. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what happened. I didn't oh. want to get into it with the family members. Yeah. But uh, unfortunate situation. Well, you know, from your position, you've interviewed so many people. I mean, you have a you have a real great observation point because you get points of view from so many people. And you and I both have seen people come and go. I I, I think of all the wrestlers I've worked with that are gone, the Archie Goldies, the Torah Kamatas, the Gene Kaniskis, uh, the Harley Race. Uh, I mean, I've worked with so many of them. I've had the privilege of working with them. And they were so kind to me to give me the opportunity to rise up in the business and 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 share my ideas and, and endorse them and, and you know that's very fortunate but i'm i'm always sad and every time i see greg oliver or somebody report somebody's gone and i often think that we should stop sometimes and just look into the past and and take a moment to recognize the people that have come and gone they've made such great contributions to the business and i think a lot of your viewers you know, it would be interested to know what these people were like outside the ring. And a lot of them were very interesting guys that really had interesting lives. And, you know, it's worth talking about them and giving them credit for who they are. And, of course, uh, Harley Race, I did get to interview him before he passed away. And he's a popular subject on this channel. So I'm sure the fans would like to hear your memories of him. Right. You know, Harley Race was so kind. I, I wrestled him for the world title he was so generous in the ring as a world champion. You know, I worked with several of the world champions. Harley was not only safe to work with, but he was so generous. We'd sit in the dress room and I'd ask him as a courtesy because I just felt it was appropriate. What do you want to do tonight? And he laid out a match that was always very generous to me, made me look great. Uh, and it wasn't my doing. It was his because he was so kind in doing that and very safe, very soft-spoken. Each time I, I saw him at CAC in Las Vegas, we had an opportunity to talk a lot. He, he was, you know, and he was very generous. He was, uh, he said a couple things to me that really caught me off guard. He, he thanked me for creating the ladder match as an example. And he said to me, you know, I know you're an idea guy. You, you brought marketing ideas to the business. And I was quite moved by that because he and I traveled in different circles. You know, we didn't stay in the same territory. So I was pretty impressed that he knew something about my history and, and he paid a tribute to me personally. So very grateful. But I never heard a person say a bad word about Harley Race. Uh, I think he's admired not only by all the people in the business, but I think the fans on a whole admire him too for who he was and what he contributed there, this business is really, uh, I've said, we have a responsibility to provide the best entertainment for the business, for our fans. And I think Harley Race certainly went above and beyond in providing the best entertainment. Now, I've heard that he liked coming to Calgary just because he would renew his license plates as Canadian plates because he liked to drive at huge speeds in the U.S. and not pay the speeding tickets did you ever experience driving with him no I, I never did so i can't i can't attest to his driving skills or 
or what his motive was there. But uh, if someone told you that, I, I'm sure it probably is true. You know, I, I ran into him in the U.S. and I ran into him here in Canada and and in Las Vegas. And like I say, each time, very, a, really a warm reception. Uh, a matter of fact, in one case, I remember Harley was being interviewed by a group of people and there was a big circle of people around them, and rightfully so. He's such a popular guy. I was standing maybe 100 feet away from him in another part of the hall, in, in the reception hall, and he turned his head, he saw me, and he broke away, and he came right over, and he spent 10, 15 minutes. So I was really quite taken by that. It's kind of like living in Hollywood, and a, an Academy Award winner comes over to you and spends time talking to you. So that was really a special moment for me. Now there's a fan on here asking about Angelo Mosca, who yeah, recently no, well. passed away after a battle with uh, Alzheimer's, I believe. Right. Um, anything you could share about him? A lot of people they either liked him or hated him because I guess he could have been a bit of a bully if yes. he didn't like you. I will speak to Angelo because I knew him very well. Uh, Angelo was always kind to me. I had several matches with him. He was a little stiff. He was a bit, I wouldn't say he had the greatest ring psychology. I, I think he brought a lot of his size and his football passed into the ring. Uh, he was, was he a great worker? I don't, I would say no, but he had a unique presence about him. You know, the, the King Kong look suited him. Uh, he and I spent hours and hours playing gin rummy together in the back seat of a car when we traveled across Western Canada and I, in the hotel, we'd play cards together. Angelo was, I would say a very bright guy. He was intelligent. He was very opinionated. He had a strong point of view about just about everything he talked about. I admired him for that. I, I mean, I, I, I had to respect him. I mean, he had a unique career in football and obviously he went on and had a big career in wrestling. So the promoters, obviously saw an opportunity with him, but he was outspoken. And I will suggest that I, I understand if there was, if there's been a difference of opinions about Angelo. So a lot of truth to whatever you've heard. Yeah. Jake, the snake's brother, Sam Houston told us about an elaborate rib. He played on Angelo one day to get back at him uh, for something, but Another guy that uh, you probably are familiar with is K Killer Carl Kerp, which a few of the fans have asked about on here. Yeah, I work with him. I didn't get to know him well, but I work with him. You know, some of the guys in the business we get to work with, and you do two or three shows with these guys in different towns, and then you don't see them again. So I remember Killer Kerp, you know, he, he was a guy I got to know a bit, a big personality, uh, but... I can't speak on a personal basis. One guy that maybe your fans would be interested in was Johnny Valentine, the father. I did a tour in Japan with him. I never met a guy in my life. I know Owen Hart was famous for pulling ribs on people. But I think Johnny Valentine, the father, the senior, he lived for pulling jokes on people. He did stuff in the trains when we traveled. He did stuff in the hotels. I remember once he was in a hotel room and he tied his boot to one of the long cords and he swung it to the room below because me and another guy were in the room below and he was trying to break our window, getting us in trouble. You had to watch Johnny Valentine. I mean, he was a guy who had a tremendous reputation in the wrestling business, but he was also a real card. I mean, I, I remember all those weeks in Japan with him. Every night I would check my... I check everything I own to make sure there wasn't a snake or there wasn't something hidden in my clothing because he was very famous for pulling ribs on people. Um, another person that passed away, of course, is Owen Hart. Right. Who you would have known. I knew him uh, since he was four years old. Yeah, a great you care kid. About he, him? Was, he was everything that was advertised. He was a great, a great father, uh, a, a great... I would tell you he was not only a great dad, but he was also uh, a great husband. He he was a, a guy who loved jokes and, and had a lot of fun doing it. I mean, he was just, he, hang on a moment. I just turned my phone off here. Um, okay, just get that off. 
there, I got some technical skills. I can turn off a phone. But uh, anyhow, yeah, Owen was a terrific kid. I knew him since he was four years old. His dad used to bring him in the ring or into their dressing room. And when he first came in, he was so little and holding Stu's big hands. Stu had hands like, like a grizzly bear. And Owen would sit there quietly in the chair. And I remember distinctly talking to him. And, you know, he was so shy and withdrawn. And then as the years went on, he grew up and... Of course, he, he ended up marrying Martha, just a terrific lady who's done very well in life, uh, is really honored him with some great fundraising and, and all kinds of things, doing a great job in the community. Uh, great kids. He's got two children of his own, a boy and a girl. Great kids doing well. But Owen truly was the salt of the earth. He was, I think his dad would, was really proud of him. And he was a guy who really was a genuine, nice guy. And you know, the characters they had in the ring for him, I sometimes think when he played a heel, that was hard for him to do because he's just naturally such a, a really nice guy. And, of course, both of the British Bulldogs have oh, passed so, away, and I'm sure yeah. you had plenty of interactions with them over the years. Tons. Like, I remember sitting with those guys, both of them. Actually, I had one of uh, Dynamite Kid's first matches in Calgary when he arrived. He might have weighed 170 pounds. Uh, Stu booked us that night for 30 minutes to a draw to go through. I will tell you, I probably lost five, six pounds. I was weighing 230 at the time. This guy could move. He was, I knew immediately when at the end of the match, this guy was destined for greatness. He was so polite. He was, I never had a bad incident with dynamite. I know I've heard tons of stories, but he was always respectful to me. He was always polite all the way through his career. Even when he got big, he got up to like 215 or whatever weight it was. He was always kind to me, even towards the end of their careers. I remember one of my last matches was in the Saddle Dome with 22,000 people here in Calgary. And it was a, a triple main event. And it was myself and the Honky Tonk Man for the North American belt. And the British Bulldogs were on the card. And we sat and talked for about a half an hour. And, you know, they asked me questions about retirement, and what to do, and, you know, all kinds of good things. Like, both of them were really great guys. It was sad and tragic that Dynamite, I know he had run-ins with people. I, I know his personality would fluctuate. Uh, I've heard of some horror stories. It, but on the other side of the coin, I had nothing but great memories with him. I would tell you pound for pound, honestly, maybe one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. If he had had the skill to manage his money, manage his life, uh, I think that he would have become a predominant person that you'd be talking to today. And of course, Davy Boy Smith. I mean, what can you not say about him? Uh, a remarkable worker, also a really nice guy. And uh, again, a dressing room, first class. But I, I know they both ran into problems over the years, and that was very unfortunate. And I would hope they're both remembered for the greatness they brought to the business versus the dark sides of their lives. Yeah, it's unfortunate because I don't even know if Davey made 40. He may have passed away at yeah. 39 or 40. So it was yeah pretty sad. And then just the whole situation after all the money he had made, um, he wasn't doing too well at the time of his death, but his no. son seems to be carrying on the legacy well. Yeah, I don't know his son well, but I, I've, I've seen him work and he looks like he really is a good worker and I can't speak to his personality. I don't know him. It would have been nice to meet him and know him, but we're two different generations. Obviously, I, I'm from the way, way back old school and he's today. So, you know, I, I watch a lot of the young guys today and admire their skills and I have fingers crossed for them that the, some of them may get the big breaks, but, you know, unfortunately, the majority of guys they get a chance, but uh, there's no long-term careers for a lot of the guys. I mean, if you're looking at financial planning or career building, unless you get in the WWF or E, uh, you're, it's pretty hard to really move forward financially or long-term planning. There's a fan in here asking about John Tenta. I don't know if you ever met him. He was yeah, from big, Vancouver. Yeah, a big guy, but I don't remember a lot about him. I, I do. I I, I can't help on that one. No, sorry. And uh, Tor Kamada, oh, I know you know him well. I love the guy. Uh, Tor Kamada was, 
you know, it was hard for him to be a bad guy. If you knew him like I did, he loved to cook. Matter of fact, at the end of his career, he moved to Saskatoon, I believe, and he opened up a restaurant. But he was the softest, gentlest, kindest guy. Uh, I remember sitting in the dressing room with him, and I used to talk to him. I, when I created the ladder match, I chose him as my opponent because he sat there and he was a student. You know, I, I he would ask me questions. He'd say, what does this ladder match look like and how long will it go? And I laid out the whole program, four, five, six weeks of it. And he sat there with a big smile on his face, and he said, whatever it takes, let's do it. You know, he was so accommodating. But he was also just a real kind, if if he had fans out there that are listening to your show, if you liked Tor Kamada, you had every reason to like him because he was really a nice man. And I was saddened when he passed, uh, as I am with so many of the other guys that are gone now. And, of course, Ed Whalen, who was the voice of Stampede Wrestling, passed away quite a while ago now, but I'm sure you were friends with him. Ed Whalen and I, right from day one, hit it off. Matter of fact, we did fundraising together outside of wrestling, uh, working in the community. He was genuinely a terrific guy, a great husband, a great father, a great community builder. He was admired and respected by all the people at the TV station where he worked. Uh, I, I can't, I never met anyone who didn't like Ed Whalen, except maybe Maka Singh, and that was all a performance. But uh, no, great guy. Uh, I can't say enough about Whalen. He was also a hockey announcer. He covered the Flames, and he did a terrific job of that. Like, you know, I've been so blessed to have worked with and met so many great people. And as I say, I'm, I'm sad. And I'm glad to still be here, but in the same breath, I, I'm sad that so many of my friends and associates are gone. Uh, Ross Hart was mentioning that Ed Whalen and Bad News Allen didn't get along too well behind the scenes. Did you notice any of that? And of course, Bad News is another one that's gone. Yeah, you know, I, I made a policy that when somebody's gone and you you may have disagreed with them or or you know not hit it off with them, I don't think it's fair for me to criticize somebody that maybe. I didn't have the chemistry with because they're not here to defend themselves. And there might be characteristics about me that people don't like. And, uh, you know, rightfully so, they may want, you know, when I'm gone, maybe they may not say anything too. I don't know. But Bad News Allen had a personality and I, I was around him quite a bit. And he and I never got to work because uh, I think the booker, I think Stu recognized that we didn't have chemistry Bad News Allen was a force, and he was genuinely a tough guy, no question. If this business was based on tough guys being the superstars, he would have been a superstar. But, uh, yeah, Bad News Allen had a pretty abrupt personality about him. I saw him in several occasions in the dressing room. He had a really short temper, and uh, I remember one night even I sort of approached him on talking about something, and he had no time to talk to me. So I, I took the message and realized that there was no way he and I were going to hit it off. But Whalen didn't have much respect for him. He thought there was a real rough edge about Bad News Allen. And I think, Ed, there's just no chemistry there. Brando wants to know about Ben Basarab, who also passed away untimely. I don't recall exactly what from. Yeah, I don't know that he, I didn't even know he passed away. I remember him in the very early years. He was an impressive, good looking young guy. Him and what's his name were tag teams who was also gone. Uh, uh, oh, gosh, he committed suicide. He killed his family. Uh, oh, Chris uh, Benoit. Yes, Chris Benoit. In the very early years, those two were very impressive young wrestlers. And I thought. Uh, Bazareth was going on to be actually a wrestler, and I'm not sure what happened to him. I think he went off in a different direction to another career. I didn't get to know him well. I didn't know he passed away. Uh, I wasn't aware of that because he was a lot younger, I think, than me or close to it. So I'm surprised to hear that. Yes, I forget exactly what he passed away from, but... Uh... I guess I'll have to ask Ross. Ross would be more familiar. Yeah, Ross is extremely, he's got, I would call it one of the best memory banks in the business. Ross is, you know, he, he's a, a consummate diplomat. I think his mother was another person, Helen Hart. A lot of people never knew her, got to know her. 
what a wonderful lady. Uh, really, uh, truly diplomatic, uh, a lot of charisma. Uh, I remember speaking to her, God, I lost track of times. Always never short on the phone. She has all the time to talk to you. Very complimentary. Uh, Ross, I think, inherited her genes because uh, he is very much that way too. Ross was a, a consummate gentleman at all time. Ross was really, he represented the business in a very, a very fulfilling way. I think from an information point, you can ask Ross about anybody in the business and he's got a recall of memory that's quite remarkable and uh, always kind and generous with, with, uh, with compliments. Very nice young man. And I was just looking it up as you were talking. Ben might not be dead. He might have just dropped off the radar. Okay. Um, someone else is asking about Larry Cameron, who also passed away. He might have been a bit after your time. Yeah, I didn't didn't know him. Sorry, no. And Brian Pillman and Chris Benoit, I assume, were after your time as well. Yeah, I met uh, Pillman. I remember him distinctly. Uh, Pillman had a really high energy. He was always bouncing around the dressing room like a very fit guy, good looking guy, well spoken, very likable personality, but he was high energy. I always thought he was like an A type personality. He was on he was on something that was keeping his energy up and uh, good worker. I mean I think he was an ex football player if I'm not mistaken and uh, Actually, a very nice guy in the dressing room and uh, unfortunately died way too young. As you know, another thing, too, that we if you look at this and statistically speaking, and I'm only guessing, but I think wrestlers tend to have the shortest lifespan. When you look at how many wrestlers who died in their 40s and 50s and 60s versus any other field of entertainment, whether it be football, hockey or what have you. I just, I don't know if that's due to steroid use. I don't know about that's mismanagement of health. I'm not sure what the answer is, but I've, I've been cognizant of the fact that it seems like so many people die so young in our business. Yes. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why it is too. Apparently concussions can also cause right. depression and that leads people oftentimes to, get into other drugs and alcohol, right? Uh, which can also contribute to an early death. I don't know if you ever met Brick Bronski, who Brian Pillman had a backstage fight with. He went on to be uh, a movie star to a certain extent, but he what also his, passed away. What was his name? Brick Bronski. No, I never met him. Sorry. No. Okay. Yeah, he, uh, he had a brief run in Stampede Wrestling, but he got into some sort of backstage altercation with with Pillman and oh I see okay that was about the end of it you but. know some of the guys I work with when I was in Los Angeles a lot of your viewers would probably know and remember quite well I remember the Tolis brothers I I got to know them very well Canadian boys from Hamilton uh, I was very fortunate to have the belt when I was in Los Angeles and and the Tolis brothers were working there Freddie Blassie was there at the time uh, I remember Bruno San Martino coming through uh, I mean, Los Angeles at the time I was there was sort of a mecca, if you will, a, a centerpiece to wrestling. A lot of us went to Japan from there. But I remember the Tolis brothers were very popular guys, very uh, dollar conscious. I remember Chris and John talking to me about they saved their money. It was important. You know, they always spoke about you never know how long you're going to be in the business for. They seemed to be guys who really had their heads together right. Freddie Blassie was a, an interesting guy in the dressing room. He was flamboyant. He was outgoing. His personality almost matched his ring personality, his persona on television. He was, I had a couple of chats with him. He was on a cane in those days, uh, so he was much older than me. But uh, I had an opportunity to meet many of the greats in the business and work with a lot of them. And uh, as I say, you know, your viewers... Uh, listeners, it's I think it's it's good that we take the time to talk about some of the wrestlers, and I like to stay in the positive vein. It would be very easy to talk about some wrestlers that I really don't have much respect for, for the reasons that I think are well founded. But I, I think this opportunity, us talking here today, we have a chance to talk about some of the greats and let the fans have a little bit of an inside look at who these people were. Billy Robinson Ooh. is another guy that's passed away after he lived a pretty long life and was doing MMA training 
with uh, some top fighters right up until he passed. But he had a big run in Stampede Wrestling. He sure did. I'm, I'm going to be as kind as I can to Robinson because it kind of it speaks to what I just said a few minutes ago about the fact that if you have a negative point of view about somebody, it's, you know, they're long gone and it's not fair. But I can share with you my experience with Billy Robinson. When he first arrived in Calgary, I think he had a chip on his shoulder or he wanted to prove to everybody how tough he was. I mean, physically tough, that he was a shooter. Everybody knew he was, we'd all heard about his reputation. Uh, but of course, the Stu had me booked, actually not Stu, a guy named Dave Rule, who was the booker at the time, booked me with Billy Robinson about four or five nights in a row. And each night he took me into the ring and he, I, I knew that all the boys were watching. All the guys were outside the dressing room watching and it took everything I had to survive with him because he pretty well tied me in knots. And, you know, these 20 minute matches were like matches from hell and, uh, you know, short of crawling back to the dress room, you know, I had enough left of me to walk back, but he, he really bullied. And, and in the dress room, he had sort of a, a, a dominating personality, if you will, now, I'd like to think on the bright side, I'd heard that years later when he went to Minnesota or where he went after that, he adapted more to the reality of working with guys, that this is a business and that cooperation will take you a lot further. So maybe maybe I was unfortunate enough to be sort of his, his test dummy, if you will, to prove to guys that he had all these fancy moves. And uh, as he advanced his career, Hopefully he changed his way, but I, I will tell you that I didn't hold much respect for him because I always felt bullies in the business. Most of us, myself included, are not tough guys. We don't come from a background of amateur wrestling or we're not, you know, I never for one minute ever announced to anybody that I had any particular skill beyond pro wrestling, but there was the odd guy who would come along who was bullies and, you know, they would, they would, take advantage of guys in the ring. So I never had much respect for guys like that. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of guys who were that way. And that brings me to Archie the Stomper Goldie. And I guess it's been documented that I think Billy Robinson tried to get rough with him one night. And I guess Archie he, just rolled out of the rig, grabbed his bag and left. And I can absolutely support that because Archie and I talked about that numerous times. Archie Goldie, in my opinion, was one of the greatest assets to the business. I mean, whether he was in Kansas City or wherever he was, I know he gave the fans great value. And, and I knew him really personally. And he was not a tough guy. Uh, in the ring, his persona was invincible. But outside the ring, he was like the rest of us. He was all about business. I think our chemistry worked so well because I used to always talk to him about this is about box office. Let's give the fans great value. Let's fill the arenas. And we can do that by telling stories. We can build up the interest. We can build up the suspense. Archie was so accommodating. I know that he never liked shooters, uh, guys who are really super tough. It wasn't that... There's nothing wrong with a shooter who gets in the ring and works professionally. But when a guy takes that great skill and uses it to brutalize somebody, uh, I don't think, I think that's a bit of a coward's root, especially when he's picking on somebody who doesn't have the same skill. But there would be a lot of truth to that. I could see Archie just jumping out of the ring and walking away because if Robinson would have done some to him, what he did to me, I, I could see Archie just saying, I'll see you. Gary Albright. Uh, is another guy that a fan's bringing up who passed through the Stampede territory. Might have been after your time. Yeah, I think so. But yeah, he also passed away young. One guy that I know that you knew was Andre the Giant. Oh, yeah, also... great, great. You know, great story. I'll, I'll share one story about Andre. Uh, we'd heard all kinds of tales about him traveling on airplanes where they he'd almost have to take up three seats. The poor guy. He was in discomfort a lot. I remember I was around him a few times and he was always trying to be comfortable. It was very difficult for Andre to be comfortable no matter where we went. It was a restaurant. The chair was never big enough. So this poor guy, he struggled. You know, he was the seventh wonder of the world. People gawked at him all the time. I mean, it's obvious it's going to happen. But I have one story that I'd like to share. And I, I might have shared this before. I'm not sure. 
but one night he and I were in a tag team match where he and I were together in the tag team match as partners. And we had a lot of fun with that. I mean, you can only imagine what our opponents would do with him in the ring. And I had a riot. It was great fun. But that night we were traveling back from Edmonton and he and I sat in the back of the limousine. And that night Stu was up front and someone else was driving. I can't remember who, but Stu had a habit of pulling into Kentucky Fried Chicken outside of Edmonton as we were always heading home on a three hour drive. So that night, Stu said, would anybody like some chicken? And, and Andre, of course, I love chicken. So uh, he said, you know, how much can you eat? And he said, just give me lots of chicken. So Stu brought a bucket. I'll never forget this. There were 21 pieces in the bucket. And Andre and I are sitting in the back. He's laughing. He's got a six pack there with him. Within, I'd say, 30 minutes, and I might be one or two minutes off, he had the whole 21 pieces eaten and all the bones were flying out the window just as quick. And he was a fun loving guy, like he really was, but he shared with me numerous times about how uncomfortable travel could be for him. It depend what kind of a car, what kind of a, you know, it was very, it was, it was exhausting for him. And I don't think people really realize because they saw him in this great state of this enormous man. And I mean, you know, he was one of the wonders of the world, but you know, he lived a short life, obviously, because, of, you know, the hindrances of life of being so big. But a very nice man, a very accommodating. And I think one of the real tributes to him is a movie that his legacy will be forever is The Princess Bride, where he plays the, the giant. And uh, I think that's something that if you want to remind yourself about Andre, just go to Netflix or something and pull up The Princess Bride. and You're going to get all the Andre the Giant you want. And, of course, we can't do this podcast without mentioning Jim the Anvil Nightheart, who passed right. away a couple of years ago. Right. And I'm sure you met him quite a few times. Yeah, I, I knew Jim. I had a couple of good discussions with him. He, again, always a gentleman. Uh, I remember, gosh, I went to a couple of funerals. We went to Owen's funeral. And, uh, I mean, Jim, for me, you know, I didn't know Jim well enough to say that I can speak in depth about him, but from the business perspective, he was always a very polite guy in the ring. I I never met anybody who didn't like him. I, I've heard, so it's not for me to really be specific, but I heard he had some habits in life that were led to his downfall. I, I know he loved his daughter very much, who has become very successful uh, she's been a great representation to wrestling. I think her dad would have been very proud of her. Uh, uh, but he was a nice guy. I think Bret Hart could speak in volumes to to Jim about him a lot more characteristically than I can. But I will just say that he was always very nice to me whenever I was around. Did you get the chance to spend much time with Dean Hart before he passed away? Yeah, that's a really good question. I knew Dean right from a very young age, a good looking guy. He had movie star looks. He had all the girls. He had so much charisma. He was like Ross, very much like Ross's personality, very likable, very, very intelligent. Uh, just he, he had this warmth about him. Dean did. And But he also had a little bit of a conniving side to him, which I liked, actually. I thought it was cute, a little bit like Smith art. He always had something going on. But Dean died far too young, if I'm not mistaken. I think kidney failure. And uh, I think it was in Hawaii. He was kind of like living on the beach or something. I, I, was, I never got the specific details. But I remember his girlfriend, and I've seen her since, uh, you know, all these years later, and and Dean was most adorable, lovable guy. Uh, you know, it just he really was. If he was still around today, you would have loved to interview him. Someone's asking on here if you ever ran into either Edward Carponche or Dick the Destroyer Buyer. You know, it's funny. Uh, the Destroyer and I in 2011 were in uh, in Las Vegas. I received an award. Uh, down there and the destroyer was there and I talked to him at the poolside he was on a cane you know I, I'm guessing he was in his early 80s maybe uh, I could tell and I knew of his reputation we came from two generation differences him and I uh, he was a superstar in his time no question about it he and his wife were there and I talked to him uh, 
I, I can't say that I got to know him well, but he was very receptive and very friendly. And then I know he passed away uh, a few years after that. And I think, matter of fact, one of the guys from CAC introduced me to him who just passed away. Carl just passed away, who was sort of a promoter, if you will, of CAC. And, uh, and uh, I talked to him there. But uh, no, I didn't know the other guy at all. Yeah, Carl Lauer, I think, was his name. He just passed away last yes. week. Yeah, yeah. I met him once. I think he was a promoter in L.A. Yes. Uh, in the past. Yeah, That's he could have been. I He was in a different time frame than me. I don't know if he was in Los Angeles because when I was in Los Angeles, Mike LaBelle, Gene LaBelle, Charlie Moto, they were running the territory at that time. So I'm not too sure where Carl was, but I think he had a, a promotion somewhere in the United States. Of course, Mike LaBelle has passed away, and he is one of the legendary promoters who was always known for having a great mind for the business. Any thoughts on him? No, I didn't get to know him well, believe it or not. It was Charlie Motor that put the belt on me, or it could have been Mike LaBelle. Mike never came in the dressing room. I didn't get to know him well for my time in Los Angeles. I got to know Gene LaBelle quite well because he was a referee and he was always in the dress room and he was chatting it up. They called him Judo Gene LaBelle, I believe. And nice guy, very personable. We had a guy named Rich who's Dugan was our referee, another really nice guy. I had a great run in Los Angeles. It, it was tremendous. I, I I was invited to the Merv Griffin show. We went out there. We had, uh, we had a lot of fun in L.A. I, I really liked my time there. Then I went to San Francisco and I worked up in San Francisco. I, I got to meet uh, uh, The Rock's dad. Uh, and, you know, we chatted a lot. I did shows in San Francisco. And then I flew off to Japan and did a tour in Japan. So got to meet a lot of the great guys. Pat Patterson, uh, you know, it was very fortunate. My timing, uh, really, I, I felt like a, a kind of a spectator that was allowed to go behind stage with everybody. All these guys were big names at the time, you know. Barbara would like to know if you ever cross paths with Gene Kaninsky. Oh, my God. Not only cross paths with him, I worked with him. Gene and I worked together so many times. I wrestled him for the Pacific Coast uh, Championship. Uh, Don Leo Jonathan, oh, I could go on for hours about him, the, the Mormon giant. Uh, the guys I worked with in Vancouver, terrific group of people. My God, there were some. Duncan McTavish was there. Stephen Little Bear was there. Uh, uh, Roy McFlaherty, I, I can't say enough about him. I don't know if any of your fans remember him. Not only a great wrestler, a referee at the end of his career, just a fine gentleman. I mean, he was coaching and helping young guys in the business, a classy guy. Gene Kaniski was exactly what you saw on television, was who he was in the dress room in real life. He was a real outdoorsman. He lived in Blaine, Washington. I got to know him personally outside the ring. He was an outdoorsman, a hunter, a fisherman. He he did it all. He had two sons that have done well, I believe. I haven't seen them in years and years and years. Kelly, I think, is one of their names. They were in the business for a while. Gene was truly a landmark, if you will, for wrestling in Canada. He was the equivalent to maybe Whipper Billy Watson of his time. Kaniski, he did interviews. You know, he, he had a patented interview. He used to thank his wrestling fans throughout Canada, and he thanked the speaker, Ron Moyer, for interviewing him. He had a real – he had a he, – he, he embedded himself into – the communities across Canada by with his personality and his ring skills, to be honest with you, was he was the smoothest guy to work with or one of the best strategists? I would say no, because every night I work with him, I'm never quite sure what we're going to do. I'd say to him, what do you want to do tonight? He'd say something like, it's okay, kid. Let's just get out there and get on with it. We got 20 minutes or whatever, and we'd go, and at the end of 20 minutes, I think, okay, I guess that's what we just did. So, but a big name, and he will be remembered for a very long time, particularly in Western Canada. Someone's asking about King Curtis. He oh, passed yeah. through Stampede a few times. I love the guy. What a fine. King Curtis Ikea was one of the nicest men. Uh, unfortunately, okay. I don't know, I should say, unfortunately, he loved his marijuana. He was always stoned no matter where he went. 
uh, and he was lovable. I mean, he was like a teddy bear. And working with him was a night off. Like I sometimes almost wish he would have maybe hit a little harder or squeezed harder or something because he was just such a pleasure to work with. It was hard to break a sweat with him. But he was the nicest guy. And he traveling in the car, he'd be I guess, smoking his marijuana or whatever. And, you know, I, I mean, he's gone now. So, you know, there's no way they're going to pursue him for that. But uh, at, at the end, I saw him in, in Hawaii. He actually had a, a kind of a surfboard rental business on the beach. And we had a great visit. He, I believe he had skin cancer at the end of his career. But what a nice guy. If somebody's a big fan of King Curtis Ikea, rightfully so. A, a terrific guy. Very, very, very kind man. Yes. And I believe he died from hepatitis or something. He, he? he was one of the guys that was bleeding all the time and he probably picked it up in the ring. Yeah, very possible. Just like Abdullah is another one who sliced a lot. I'm surprised. That I don't know if Abby's got hepatitis or not. You know, surprise. He did. He did have it at one point. I don't know if he got cured or not. But okay. uh, it's amazing he's still alive. Exactly. Yeah, it's certainly not. He's not on a fitness program. That's for sure. No, uh, Brandon is wondering if you could elaborate on Don Leo Jonathan. Oh, well, I don't know where to start with him. Maybe a lot of people didn't know this, but he had a skin diving business too. Uh, this is Don Leo Jonathan. What a class act. Again, for the fans out there who liked Don Leo Jonathan and supported him, you had the right pick. Uh, this was a truly a fine man. I traveled with him a lot on the road. We traveled, When I was in, in uh, BC doing shows, we traveled to the US, him and I across the border, or we'd go to Chilliwack or different places. You know, always a pleasure. Just a really well-spoken guy, a great family man. He loved his wife dearly. Uh, just a class act and truly a powerful man. Like he he could have been a menace if he wanted to be. Not at all. He, he was truly a class act. Uh, a guy that if you wanted to admire someone and look up to someone and be mentored by someone, I would say Don Leo Jonathan would have been a great choice. Now, you spent a lot of time in Japan here and there. Um, could you talk about some of the Japanese uh, wrestlers you may have encountered or, or Americans that you met in Japan? That yeah, I, I could sum the Japanese wrestlers up in one statement. Very fit people. Uh, you know, when I went over there, I was working with Seiji Sakaguchi in the main events for the championship. The, him and I had wrestled in Los Angeles, and he won the belt for me, and then I followed him to Japan to try and win it back. But in some of the towns, wherever I toured, I'd worked with different Japanese guys. They were all very fit, and, and very. the fans in Japan are totally different than North American fans. So the Japanese people, the, the wrestlers, they, they were proud of what they did. So I quickly learned that, you know, I, there was no comedy acts. It was all about working solid and, and being there for them and, and coordinating and cooperating with them to work. But Japanese wrestlers were different than the catch as catch can style of wrestling that we have in North America. I think some of the Japanese wrestlers came to North America and adapted to our style. I think of Mr. Hito, I, I think of Fuji, I think of a lot of guys who were very North American style. But the guys I work with in Japan who had never come to North America, they, they were, it was a solid style of wrestling and you had to be fairly fit. Uh, I always found myself pretty exhausted at the end of the match, but they weren't dangerous to work with. I never had any problems with any of them. They were, again, very polite. The language difference makes it very difficult, too. You can't call high spots in the ring when you're working with somebody that you don't speak their language. But there's a naturalness about working with them. So they were they were good. Uh, on my tour, I had Earl Maynard, Johnny Valentine. Oh, gosh, there were, there were some of the biggest names. And they were great. And I was very privileged to be uh, pretty well main events wherever I went or throughout Japan. So well-received. Japanese people treat you with great respect, and uh, it, was, it was a great tour. I, I was very privileged to have that trip. Did you know Tokyo Joe very well? Yeah, a little bit. I got to know him. He lost his leg in a car that hit him on the highway going to Lethbridge. 
Uh, I knew him. He was very quiet in the dressing room. I didn't know him well enough to say that I ever worked with him or that, but he was around during my time. Stu really liked him. I, all the guys liked him. He had a good reputation. Everybody liked him. As Mr. Hito, he's gone now too, I'm told. Uh, he was another guy that was well-liked, well-respected. Someone was asking about Bulldog Bob Brown earlier. Oh, yeah. I worked with Bob Brown numerous times. Bob Brown had a personality, too, that stood out. It's funny people remember people who have these flamboyant personalities, like Gene Kaniski. Bob Brown was another one. And he had a look about him, so I understood the name Bulldog Brown. Uh, you know, he had a little bit of a look that was unique. Uh, he was a guy. I worked with him. He was a pleasure to work with. He was pretty outspoken in the dressing room. He was pretty loud, and, and but not, not boisterous, but just... He was, uh, his personality was larger than life as well, but he was very popular out on the coast. He did very well. He came to Stampede Wrestling as well. And, uh, you know, he was there in Vancouver when I was there. I, I had two two uh, times in Vancouver and British Columbia. I went back and forth. It was great. I loved it. You know, Vancouver Island is my home where I grew up. Vancouver is where I was born. So for me, returning to Vancouver and the promoter, Sander Kovacs, and Gene Kaniski, who was also the promoter, they treated me well. I had a great run with Al Madrill as a tag team partner. We had the belts. Wayne Bridges, who has passed away, terrific English wrestler. Les Thornton, another one. What a great guy. If people only knew how nice these two guys were. If you were fans of Les Thorntons or Wayne Bridges, you, you, you pick good guys to be a fan of. Terrific guys. What about John Foley? Did you know him very well? Well, oh. Mr. Whalen, yeah. yeah, Foley was truly animated. Foley was really, truly an integral part of Stampede Wrestling. I think he brought as much value to the to the entertainment business as Ed Whalen brought to the business, as Stu Hart brought to the business, as any of us individually brought to the business. John Foley brought as much. He didn't have to work in the ring. His personality was larger than life. And in the dressing room, he was a hoot. I used to, when I joined his army once in disguise and all that, it was my suggestion to join his army. And then I would abandon the army and backstab him and come back as a baby face. And that was all my plan. And John Foley was the most open-minded guy to ideas. You know, he would sit there and have a big smile. And I'd say, John, I suggest this, this. And I thought, well, maybe he won't agree. I love it, Don. That will be lovely. We'll be going out and doing that tonight. I like it very much. Then he would get in front of the microphone and, and call Ed Whalen out, call the rest of us out. I mean, Foley was truly a lot of fun to work with. I, I don't know what age he was when he passed, but I was sad when I heard he was gone. Luther Lindsay, somebody's asking about on here, one of the uh, first black wrestlers in Stampede. Before my time, uh, I heard great things about him. He was a really a tough guy. Apparently, Stu Hart used to tell me numerous stories about Luther Lindsay. Uh, great, great guy. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't speak to him. I just heard he's truly was a great wrestler. And what about Mike Shaw? I think he was after you, him and Beef Wellington. Oh, I worked with Mike Shaw. We had quite a few programs together. Actually, you know, for his size, he was very agile. You know, I would drop kick him and he was back up on his feet just as quick as anybody could be. And he was another guy. You know, I sat with Mike Shaw, Muckasing, and, you know, and I talked to him about ideas, suggestions. He was very open minded. He was a pleasure to work with. Uh, another guy, his persona was larger than life. I'm sure he upset a lot of fans, but that was his job. I mean, when you really think about this to your listeners and viewers, is that the, fa the the bad guy's job was to make you mad at them. Because I always used to say, the madder the fans are at the bad guy, that makes me look better. That means there are more fans for me now because they're also mad at him. What was difficult sometimes was to work with a villain who the fans loved him. And I will tell you, Archie Goldie had a great following of fans that really admired him and respected him. So some nights when Archie would go in the ring, he was kind of like Donald Trump in his fan piece. People loved Archie Goldie. And even though he was a villain, people would cheer for him because they loved the magnitude of who he was. So, you know, it was hard sometimes to be the most favored person in the ring when you had a villain who the fans loved too. 
And I don't know if you ever met Ron Bass, but Big Fish is wondering if you ever had any interaction with him. I never worked with him, but I know him well. We've been at CAC together. Uh, Ron is a terrific guy. He lives back east. He's on Facebook all the time. He was at CAC. Everybody loves him. He's a, a terrific guy. Uh, I've had a lot of fun joking around with him. Uh, we sometimes sort of joke back and forth on Facebook. But uh, I know that he, he had a pretty good run in the business. We just never crossed paths. But uh, a very likable guy. If, if you know if you know him, he, he's a good guy. Craig wants to know about Big Daddy Ritter, the junkyard dog. I don't know if you were there don't when know. he was around. No, I don't know. We never connected. He was another one that, that passed away far too soon. But you retired fairly young. As you talked about in a previous interview, you went into several different employments, including uh, being a prison guard where you were once shot and then you um, ended up opening a successful auto business. Uh, and now you're still involved with various things in Cochrane, Alberta, including a bicycle path from Cochrane to Calgary. So depending on how fast a driver you are, that's about a half hour drive. Right. Um, so it's pretty <coughs> neat that there's now a bicycle path because for the fans that don't know, I used to actually live in Cochrane. So I'm very right. familiar with that commute. You know, I, I thank you for that because it gives me a segue into talking about one of the great initiatives that I'm working on right now, which is just a great pleasure, is we, as most Canadians know, the Great Canadian Trail goes from coast to coast. And this is a trail that you can hike, you can bike, and it goes, I mean, there's thousands of kilometers already done. But like links in a chain, there are certain segments of the trail that are not finished. And there's a piece between Calgary and Cochrane, which is approximately 30 some kilometers, and a portion, a portion of it's already done. So I'm working with a terrific team of people here, and we're going to finish that trail. So if you came out to Calgary or visit Cochrane, you could get on your bicycle and ride all the way over 30K along the river on this spectacular trail. Now, there's already a connecting trail that goes from Canmore, Alberta to Banff, Alberta. It's called the Legacy Trail. And we would like to eventually hook our trail up to there so people could actually visit, go all the way to Banff on the trail. I mean, it'd be spectacular. These are one of the initiatives I'm working on. And I have a bikeathon coming up shortly, a fundraiser where we're going to do, and we've been invited to be part of participation this year in June. So I've got a bikeathon coming up. Uh, we're excited about that. It's a fundraiser, and we're going to be out there working with the community. We want to finish this trail. I'm, I'm working with a tremendous group of people who are so talented and skilled, and, and we're going to get this trail. It's a $20 million project. We have approximately $4 million in place. We have two years to finish the trail, which we think we're going to do. And I would suggest to any of your viewers or listeners, if they're ever in the Calgary area or out here, Gosh, all you got to do is look it up. Uh, uh, it's 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 quite a quite an achievement that we're going to uh, finish, and I, I think that a lot of people will benefit from this trail. You know, retirement is an interesting thing. A lot of us find different places and things to do, and I have been so blessed in finding community engagement has been so fulfilling. Volunteerism. The reward is overwhelming when you work with a great, great people. We all have the same focus, the same vision to fulfill betterment for others. And uh, it certainly helped me. Maybe it's even got me to almost 77. I'm not too sure. But uh, I'm, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to do that and still be here. Have you heard that apparently they're tearing down the Victoria Pavilion next year? Uh, I don't think so. If you heard that, I'm not sure where, because I saw them renovate that a few years ago for the Stampede okay. grounds. So I think it's there. But they did tear down the other big building, uh, the Corral. It's gone. That was a show that we did Stu Hart's 80th birthday uh, party on in, in 1995. I was a part of that show. I think it, you can pull it up if I'm not mistaken. There's a whole one-hour special on Stu's 80th birthday. It may be on YouTube. Uh, but they tore that building down, and they are doing expansions in the grounds there now. 
Okay, well, that would be good. It was Spencer Tapley, who you might know as Mark the Shark to Carlo, that told me that about the pavilion. Yeah, he he may be right. There's a guy who's really on top of the business. Like, I know him quite well. He lives in Cochrane. He does a great job out here promoting wrestling. And he works at the venue, which is a, one of the more popular bars here. Uh, he's so involved. Great guy. Does a lot of great work. If he said that, he would he might know. I didn't know that. I, I know they renovated the adjoining building, so maybe it is destined to be torn down. It'd be a shame. If I hear they are going to, I'm going to go in there and do some videotaping because for me, there's a lot of memories in there. There's a lot of a lot of ghosts in that building. You can only imagine how many wrestlers have passed through that pavilion over 50, 60 years. It's it's quite remarkable. If they are, I want to promote a last event there. Yeah, well, I, that'd be I actually great. tried calling them after Spencer told me that, but they haven't got back to me yet. I'll tell you what, if you do that, because I appreciate what you do for your fans and what you do for us, you you in, in, in doing these shows, you not only give us a, an opportunity to speak about our past and bring up great memories, but also you're preserving our history. You're, you're protecting our legacy. So I would say this to you, uh, by one way or another, if you did a show in that building, I'd be happy to come down and referee a ladder match or do whatever I'm still physically able to do. I'd, I'd be happy to work with you and help you promote it. Sounds good. Well, I'll keep you posted because uh, I never got to wrestle there because by the time I was in Stampede Wrestling, they were promoting at the Ogden Legion, but as a Stampede yeah. Wrestling fan, yeah, I've, I've want to cross that off my bucket list. So I'll, I'll keep in touch with you on that. Is there anything else you'd like to uh, promote or talk about before we close off here? Not really. I Again, I just like to emphasize the fact that I always take the opportunity to say that uh, <clears throat> the fans play such an integral role and your viewers, uh, your followers should know that I know I speak for other wrestlers. I know for myself, absolutely, that without you, the fans, there was no professional wrestling. None of us had an opportunity to have a career. I've traveled to cities in the world that I probably never would have seen. I've had experiences that I, I'm grateful for. So if the fans are not in the arenas, we would have never had a career. So we should never stop and take for granted and think that we are the most important people out there. We're not. We're just a part. We're a team. The fans, us, promoters, the referees, everybody involved in the business make a difference. So in closing, I just want to thank everyone for their support over the years, yours included. And I'll just, uh, I got to throw in one more question. This isn't somebody that's passed, but it's come up a few times. So I don't want to ignore the fans on it. If you ever met Carlos Colon. Oh my goodness. He... I know Carlos Colon so well. I will tell you about Carlos Colon. In the early 70s, he came here. He's from Puerto Rico. He and I traveled m so many miles together in cars. We used to play cards in the back seat. Uh, we traveled from town to town. He was a very good worker, a high-flying wrestler. Uh, he went on with a guy named Victor Javico to Puerto Rico. They became promoters. I, I lost touch with him after that. But he has one distinction that I've always thought was important to clear up, is that Dave Rule was a well-known wrestler in Western Canada, and he was the booker for Stu Hart. And one night, Carlos Colon, I'll make this a short story. I could give you the details, but... One night, and I've heard different versions, so I think it's important that the true version be told because I was there. We were traveling to Saskatoon, and Carlos and I were in the back seat of the car, and Dave Rule was the driver, and he was smoking a cigar. And the smell of the cigar was overwhelming, and uh, Carlos asked him to put the cigar out, and he didn't put it out. And then Carlos put his window down a bit, and Dave Rule said to him, put that window back up. And they got into a difference. And then Dave Rule pulled the car over the side of the road. They both got out. It was a cold night. The ground was very slippery, the asphalt. And Carlos did not punch him. He slapped his face. And his feet, Dave Rules, went from under him. He went back and hit his head on the ground. He was unconscious for a moment or two. Another car with wrestlers was coming behind us a little ways, a few minutes behind 
took Carlos Colon and his friend uh, from New York. Oh, I, I forgot his name now. If you brought it up, I'd remember. But they jumped in the car. They carried on. I picked up Dave Rule. I put him in the back seat of the car. He was still semi-unconscious. I drove him to Saskatoon. He finally came around, but he was still groggy. I put him in the hotel room. I checked him in, and uh, he stayed all night. Next day, I went to his room to get him. Carlos Colon had nothing to do with him after that, uh, and uh, and Dave Rule got a concussion and ended his career. And Dave Rule died, I think, a few years later, but severe concussion. But Carlos Colon, that's a story I wanted to get clear because that was absolutely the truth of what happened. But Carlos Colon was a great, good worker, a nice guy. Him and I spent a lot of time together traveling. I, I called him a friend, and I don't know, you know what he's been doing in the last 15, 20 years. I'm, I'm not aware of it. But I will tell you his time in Calgary, he was very well liked. He was very successful. From what I heard recently, his health isn't that great these days, but he is no. getting up there in age. Yeah, he's close to my age, I believe. I'll, I'll be 77 in June. I would suspect Carlos is right around there too. Yes, I, I heard something about dementia, but that yeah. wasn't from a direct source. Yeah, uh, well, but... it, it could be true. I mean, we're all suffering for things. I mean, I had a diagnosis three, four years ago, which, you know, I'm working with and, and you know, I, I do the best I can. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I, I, well, I try to work out, walk every day, try and stay in shape. But sometimes in life, you inherit things. My father had some genetic factors that I inherited and uh, I'm dealing with them. But again, I, I want to emphasize the fact that I'm, I'm here and uh, I'm grateful for that. But you do you do learn to, as you get older. I call it relinquish and replace. You have to give up the things you can no longer do and replace them with bowling and checkers and things like that. You know. Well, we're glad you're still around, and we hope you have many, many more years to come. You've had a lot of fans commenting on here. A few people said you were their favorite all-time wrestler. So people still remember you, even though – you haven't been in the ring as a full-time wrestler for decades. So thank you very much again. And I'll just let you close this off however you want. You know what? I, I think I've said it all again. Thank you to the fans. Thank you for the kind words. And, uh, you know, if ever an opportunity arises where I can be helpful or instrumental in helping young wrestlers with conversation advice on maybe looking at the future and planning or if there's anything coming to Calgary or out in this area that you have planned, uh, I'd be more than happy to help work with you to make it successful uh, because I think the fans always have an appetite for new and exciting things in the world of pro wrestling. So again, thank you. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please help me out and like this video. Then click